Hello, everybody. Uh, I am Leslie Mahalik from McAndrews Law Offices. And today, uh, I and my colleague, Jennifer Simons, uh, will be talking about some different planning options uh, to use when a person who is getting public benefits comes into money. So in many cases, this will be from a personal injury action, uh, but it also it can apply in other situations. Uh, a common one that we see a lot is when somebody inherits money outright. Uh, so if there was an insurance policy that is left to this person outright free of trust, then that person might might want to use some of the settle, of the planning options that we'll be talking about today. So uh, Jen and I thought that we would first start with giving you a brief, very brief overview of the public benefits that you want to watch out for. Uh, these are the benefits that are what we call resource dependent, meaning that someone cannot have too much money in his or her own name and still qualify for these benefits. So if you have a client or a family member who is receiving these benefits, and if they do come into money from a personal injury action, from an inheritance or otherwise, then uh, we may want to utilize one of the planning options that we'll discuss today. So on the monetary side, the main social security benefit that is resource dependent and that you want to watch out for is supplemental security income or SSI. Uh, for the purposes of our talk today, that is a benefit that a person can receive if they are disabled under the social security standards and if they have less than $2,000 in their own name. So as you can see, even if somebody is receiving a smaller inheritance or settlement, if it is over $2,000 and if that person has SSI, uh, then some planning is going to be needed in order for the person to continue his eligibility for SSI. Um, SSI entitles the person to a monthly check from Social Security. The maximum benefit that a person can receive this year in 2020 is $783 per month. And then there's also a small uh, Pennsylvania state supplement that they might be entitled to as well. Uh, in order to qualify for SSI, the person does not need to have a work history. Again, it's just based on their disability and also on their resources as well as their income. SSI is different than Social Security Disability Income or SSDI. That is a different benefit uh, which a person usually gets based on his or her own work history although there are, there are other uh, ways that a person can qualify for that as well. So it is important to first uh, find out what type of social security the person might be getting. Along with social security, uh, they also might receive Medicaid, which uh, Jennifer will start talking about now. Yep, thank you, Leslie. Um, so another public benefit, like Leslie mentioned, is Medicaid. And Medicaid is a program that will provide health insurance to individuals who qualify medically and financially. Um, it is a program, it actually has many different programs, but typically the requirements will, will be very similar to those for SSI in terms of you know, their financial and um, medical eligibility. It's run by the Pennsylvania Department of Human Services. Um, and so, like with SSI, you're probably going to have a limit of $2,000 that you can have in your name, which can be a problem if you inherit or if you receive money as part of a settlement. Uh, that's really anything over that $2,000 could cause you to lose your eligibility for Medicaid. Um, if you qualify for SSI, you will automatically qualify for a medical assistance. Um, another program of Medicaid is called Medicaid Waivers, and that's a program where an individual, again, you have to qualify medically and financially, that an individual would be able to receive care in their home and receive um, different type of services in their home, rather than having to go into a facility and um, receive them there. It's basically funding that is a waiver, um, financial funding that would allow you to receive these services. Again, there are many different type of waivers. Uh, two of the most common for people who have an intellectual disability 
are what's called the person family directed support waiver and again provide services in your home um, if you qualify another waiver but very similar to that is called a consolidated waiver and that again will allow an individual to you know receive services in their home um, and that would also allow them actually to qualify to get residential placement too and provides more funding than the person family directed support waiver another waiver would be the autism waiver for people with autism um, there are many different type of waivers but again you have to qualify uh, waivers are not entitlement program meaning that you don't automatically get them many times there is a long waiting list um, and the waivers are the funding is given out according to need so somebody with a higher need will get the waiver before another individual who does not need it as badly um, so again these are uh, dependent upon qualifying so if you're going to be getting a large amount of money or any money that would put you over that resource limit um, you know you may want to think about doing some of the things that we're going to be talking about in a few minutes with that money in order to protect your eligibility to keep your Medicaid or your Medicaid waiver and um, Leslie now is going to talk about one option to do with that money to keep your benefits. Great. Thanks, Jen. Um, okay, so there are, if you do have a client or again a family member who is getting SSI or Medicaid, and if they are coming into money from a settlement, inheritance, or otherwise, then uh, in all likelihood you're going to want to do some planning so that they can keep their eligibility for those benefits. So there are several different types of trusts that we will talk about. The first one that I'm going to discuss is what we call a self funded special needs trust. This is a trust that is allowed under both federal law and also state law. And there's a lot of very particular requirements when we are doing this type of trust. It does have to be drafted very carefully to make sure that you meet all of these federal and state requirements. These trusts also vary significantly state to state depending on the particular state requirements. Uh, but overall, in general, in, in Pennsylvania, uh, the first thing that you have to be aware of is that a person can only put his money into one of these trusts if he is under age 65. If you're over 65, uh, we're really in the realm of elder law planning and there's some different options, uh, but we're no longer able to use one of these self-funded special needs trusts. If the person is under age 65 though, and if he is disabled under the social security standards, and if he comes into money, he can transfer his money into this type of self-funded special needs trust and immediately uh, become eligible for both SSI and Medicaid if he's otherwise eligible. There's no look back period here. So when you hear about that five year look back period, that does not apply to this type of trust. If a person's eligible to do this type of trust, then he can put his money in and immediately become eligible. So no look back period. Um, so again, in order to, to utilize one of these trusts, the person must be under age 65. These trusts can only be drafted for the sole benefit of one person who is disabled. Uh, and that sole benefit requirement is construed very strictly by Social Security and also our state Medicaid agency, the Pennsylvania Department of Human Services. So any expenditures from the trust are going to need to be for the sole benefit of the beneficiary. It's been interpreted to mean that it is for the primary benefit of the beneficiary. These trusts can only be established by a certain group of people. So those persons are the competent beneficiary himself. Uh, if the person with disabilities is competent, he can self-settle his own self-funded special needs trust. If not, then they can be established by the person's parent, grandparent, court appointed legal guardian and if you don't have any of those persons available to establish this trust then it would have to be established by the court uh, in a, you know by a court petition and hearing generally 
A really important feature of these trusts is that at the end of the day when the trust ends, so it's usually going to be when the beneficiary passes away, uh, but if the trust was going to end during the beneficiary's lifetime, then any monies remaining in the trust must first be made available uh, to the state Medicaid agency, to the Pennsylvania Department of Human Services, to repay it for all of the Medicaid provided to the beneficiary during his lifetime. So there is that payback from the trust. That's a very important requirement. And we're not able to limit the payback to the term of the trust. It does have to go for the lifetime of the beneficiary. Um, but again, you know, like I said, if the person's able to put his money in the trust to become eligible for Medicaid right away. Uh, however, at his passing, there is that payback to the state. Now, if the person uses all of the money in the trust during his lifetime, as long as it's used for valid purposes for his sole benefit, then there would not be any payback uh, to Medicaid. And also it's important to note that that Medicaid payback is only for the actual Medicaid paid out on behalf of the beneficiary. Uh, so it's just a payback for what Medicaid actually paid. And in many cases, Medicaid pays a lot less than it would cost if a private insurance was paying for the medical costs. Um, in these trusts, there has to be a trustee in place, and that trustee has to have the complete and total discretion to make or withhold payments. So this is not the type of trust where the beneficiary can get all income or can get an allowance each month. Instead, there is going to have to be a trustee or basically a gatekeeper in place um, that will make distributions on behalf of the beneficiary. That being said, though, as long as the trust is drafted properly, it truly can be used in a very broad manner. Uh, and the whole point of these trusts is that they are designed to increase the quality of life for the person with special needs. So they can be used for all kinds of things for the beneficiary. Uh, if drafted properly, it absolutely can be used um, for transportation, to buy clothing. It can be used for housing. Housing. It can be used for a vacation for the beneficiary and someone or, or the person's necessary to accompany him. It can be used for furniture, for electronics, television, uh, paying for the cable bill, for a cell phone, for computer, adaptive technology. Um, really anything above and beyond what the public benefits are supposed to pay for. Uh, these trusts are supposed to supplement public benefits and not supplant them. Uh, so the trustee will use the trust monies to pay for all the things that public benefits would not provide for. Uh, one last thing I would note is that in Pennsylvania, uh, when we do these types of trusts, we do have to get approval of the trust from our state Medicaid agency. Uh, and also, if we are doing one of these trusts for a minor or a person who has been declared to be incapacitated by the court and has a guardian appointed, in those cases, we may need a court petition in order to move the money into the trust. And also, in many of those cases, we're going to have to draft the trust so that the principle is restricted. That means that before we're able to spend trust principle, we may have to go to court and request approval to do that. That. Um, but obviously these trusts are going to vary case by case uh, based on the particular circumstances. Okay, so I think Jen is now going to talk about some uh, different options uh, in addition to the self-funded special needs trust. Yes, I'm going to talk about um, two, two options if the person is not receiving a large amount of money. Um, it, you know, if it's going to be a smaller settlement, then one option that you could do would be to do a pooled special needs trust, um, which is similar to the trust that Leslie was talking about, the self-funded trust. However, a pooled trust is run by a nonprofit agency. So they would be the trustee and the money is pulled together, the money of the person with the disability is pulled together with money of other disabled individuals in the pool. 
Um, they, there would still be a separate account for the person with a disability. However, for investment purposes, um, the money is all pulled together and there would be a master trust agreement. Um, this is a good option when somebody, if, if they're over age 65, as Leslie talked about, you, they wouldn't be able to do a self-funded special needs trust. So this might be a good option for that. Um, also, typically the, the startup cost to set up a pooled trust is usually going to be a little bit less than doing a self-funded trust. Um, another thing to point out about a pooled trust is that at the death of the beneficiary, beneficiary um, the money that is left in, the, in their account remains in the trust for the other disabled beneficiaries meaning that you can't leave the money to anybody else. You can't name a contingent beneficiary. So that might be um, a, you know, a drawback to using a pooled trust. However, if the money remains in the trust, then you don't have to have that payback that you would have with the self-funded trust. As long as the money remains in the, in the trust at their death, um, the money would not need to be paid back to the state of Pennsylvania for the medical assistance provided to them. So again, a pooled trust can be a good option if you don't have a lot of money um, or, you know, if you're, you're over age 65 and you can't do a self-funded trust, you're, you know, over the limit to fund that. Um, another option would be to spend down the money, quickly spend down the money that you're receiving. And again, this could be a good option if you're over age 65 and can't do the special needs trust. Um, also could be a good option if somebody already has items that they know that they need to purchase. Um, if, if you know that you need a car or even if you want to purchase a home, um, the money can be used for that. However, it needs to be spent down in the month that you receive it. So for instance, if somebody receives their settlement money on July 5th, that money would then need to be completely spent down to their allowable resource limit by the last day in July. It's not a 30 day period. It has to be spent down in the month that they receive it. Um, if they do that, then they probably likely will not lose their benefits. If you're not able to do it within that month period, you can still spend down the money on um, exempt resources that I'll talk about in a minute but you may have a lag where you would lose your benefits and then have to reapply again once your money gets down below, you know, get to that limit that's allowable. Um, you know, it can be spent on anything virtually for the sole benefit of the beneficiary, very similar to with the self-funded trust, has to be for their sole benefit, meaning they can't gift the money away to anybody. You have to pay fair market value for anything that would be purchased. Um, you know, some examples, again, are very similar to the self-funded trust. You could use it on um, home furnishings, on a vacation, entertainment, um, education. You could pay off any legally enforceable debt with the money. You could pay attorney fees if you want to, you know, do an estate plan, have your estate planning documents drafted. You could pay for that with the money. Um, so virtually, you know, again, anything for the sole benefit of the individual with a disability, the money could be spent on. Um, and then again, once you're down to that, you know, $2,000 limit, you could then reapply for your benefits if you don't spend it within that um, month, the month um, that you receive it. Um, so, you know, again, these are two possible options if you're not getting a large amount of money or if you know you're over that that age limit to do the self-funded special needs trust um, and uh, Leslie's going to talk about another type of account that you could put your money in an able account yes thank you Jennifer um, okay, so the ABLE accounts. This is a relatively new uh, option that we have. There was a federal law passed by Congress in at the end of 2014 that allowed these ABLE accounts. And then Pennsylvania established its own ABLE account program a little bit after that. 
So the ABLE account is an additional savings account uh, that is not going to be countable for purposes of SSI or Medicaid eligibility, specifically designed for persons who are disabled, again, under the Social Security standards. A really important thing to note with the ABLE account is that to qualify for one, the person must have been disabled before age 26. So, um, you know, there has been some proposed legislation to make that age a little bit older, but that has not yet passed. So right now, uh, in order to qualify for an ABLE account, the person must have been disabled before 26. Uh, ABLE accounts are modeled after 529 plans. So that means that when monies are put into the ABLE account, they're going to grow income tax free. And as long as the monies in the account are used for the beneficiary's qualified disability expenses, then the growth that has accumulated on the monies in the account will not be subject to income tax. Uh, if the monies in the account are used for things beyond these qualified disability expenses, then it would be subject to income tax, at least on the growth portion, as well as a 10% penalty. And uh, some examples of qualified disability expenses include education, housing, transportation, wellness, legal fees, administrative fees, financial planning, and the person's funeral. So those are just some examples of what can be used from the ABLE account. Um, with the ABLE account, you are limited in how much can be deposited into the account each year. So in general, the yearly contribution is going to be capped at the amount of the um, federal gift tax exemption for that year. So in 2020, it's capped at the amount of $15,000. Uh, there's some isolated exceptions to that if the beneficiary is working. Uh, but for the most part, uh, the total amount of contributions that can be made to the ABLE account each year from all sources combined is going to be $15,000. So like if, for example, the person puts $15,000 of their personal injury action into the ABLE account, uh, then no one else can contribute to that account for the remainder of the year. If the account balance has over $100,000 in it, at that point, it, uh, the amount over $100,000 will be countable for purposes of SSI eligibility. Uh, but as long as the account has less than $100,000, the person will retain eligibility for both um, SSI and Medicaid. The ABLE account is a very nice option because it gives the beneficiary a little bit more freedom and control over the monies in the account. The monies are going to be held and administered by a state agency, so there's no trustee in place, um, but the beneficiary can direct how the monies are spent. Uh, and Pennsylvania does have an option to allow a debit card to be used. Uh, so that's different than the self-funded special needs trust that we talked about or about the pooled trust we uh, discussed. Um, so the person can have a little more freedom with the ABLE account. Um, because we are limited in the yearly contribution, it's capped at that $15,000, uh, the ABLE accounts are not going to be able to accept, say, you know, a um, personal injury settlement in the amount of $75,000 or an inheritance of $75,000. Uh, but that being said, it really can be very useful in the right cases. It's particularly useful if a person does have a smaller settlement or inheritance. If it's in the $10,000 range, that entire amount can go right into the ABLE account, again, so long as the person was disabled before age 26. Also, if you have a person over age 65 who was disabled before 26, uh, then the ABLE account can be used uh, in those cases as well. And then additionally, uh, even if a settlement or an inheritance is in excess of 15,000, the person could always select to put for the first 15 into the ABLE account. And we have a lot of clients that are doing that. Um, they'll put the first 15,000 of their personal injury settlement right into the ABLE account, and then the remainder can go into a special needs trust, or maybe they'll do a spend down. Um, you know, they can do any combination of these uh, options that we are talking about. 
And lastly, one important thing to note about the Pennsylvania ABLE account is that at the person's passing, there is actually no uh, payback to the de Pennsylvania Department of Human Services for Medicaid provided to the person. The federal law says that states can enforce a payback to these accounts, uh, but Pennsylvania is not doing that at this time. So again, the ABLE account can be a really nice option to use in combination uh, with some of the other things that we've been talking about today. Okay. And I'm going to talk about mm -hmm. um, another option for a different type of trust um, called a settlement protection trust. And this is a good option if the person who um, is receiving the settlement money, if they don't require public benefits or if they're going to be receiving such a large amount of money that they'd be able to lose their benefits and still be able to live on um, the amount of money that they're getting as part of the settlement. Uh, you, the main difference with this type of trust, again, is that it, it's not going to protect them in terms of allowing them to remain eligible for public benefits. It's not a special needs trust. The purpose really is to have a trust where the money can be managed um, by a trustee in order to uh, allow the money to grow, you know, to prevent the money from being spent too quickly. Um, it, and again, it, it can be managed by a trustee who's going to be able to invest the money um, and hopefully have it grow over their lifetime. Um, it can be, you know, used, it can be drafted much more flexible flexibly than uh, the, so the special needs trust. Um, you know, because of the rules and requirements with the special needs trust, uh, this is a better option, again, if, if the person does not need public benefits. If they do, then, you know, you want to do some other type of uh, trust that we talked about. Um, but just wanted to mention it in case, you know, it could be a really good option for somebody, again, who doesn't need public benefits or who is okay with losing them and, you know, putting all of the money into uh, this type of trust. You also, of course, wouldn't have the payback problem because it's not a special needs trust. Um, so just an option if you're, you know, if they're getting a lot of money and don't want to use a special needs trust or any of the other options we talked about. Yeah, I mean, obviously, this planning is very individual to uh, the person. Um, it really depends, you know, on what the best option is for them. So, uh, you know, Jennifer and I do a lot of these cases, and we help try to find the best options for people. Absolutely. I just wanted to note really quickly, um, you know, in some uh, cases where a person is getting a personal injury action, they may want to purchase a structured settlement with part of the settlement proceeds. Uh, that can have some income tax benefits, and it might be just a good uh, decision all around for the person. So if that is something that they want to consider, we certainly can do that in conjunction with a special needs trust. There's just a few requirements that we like to see when we are utilizing an annuity or a structured settlement with a special needs trust. Uh, the first one is that we still want to make sure there's enough seed money that's put into the trust outside of the structure, enough seed money to meet all of the reasonably anticipated needs of the beneficiary. Um, so for example, if the beneficiary needs a new car or might want to purchase a home right away, uh, we want to make sure Sure there's enough money in the trust to allow for that. Um, the next requirement that we like to see is that the special needs trust itself has to be named as the beneficiary of all of the annuity payments. So it has to receive all of the payments during the beneficiary's lifetime and the special needs trust also must be named as the residual beneficiary so that if the beneficiary were to pass away, uh, that any remaining payments from the structure would go directly into the special needs trust. The state Medicaid agency is going to require that uh, because they don't want uh, to evade the payback. So they want any remaining money from the structure to go into the trust so that uh, any Medicaid payment payback can be made uh, from the trust. After that, the trust can be closed and any remaining monies would go however the trust dictates. 
And then the last thing that we like to see is what we call a commutation clause. That means that if the beneficiary passes away, any outstanding structure payments would become immediately due and would be paid into the trust. The reason that is helpful here is because it allows for a timely payment of the Medicaid payback, as well as any sort of death taxes and other administrative expenses. And once all of those things are done and paid, then the trust can be closed and the monies remaining can go however the trust says. Um, you know, we have had a case or two where the structure continued to pay out uh, in payments because there was no commutation clause and the trust just had to remain open for quite some time while the Medicaid payback was made over time. Uh, but it just again, something to uh, just be aware of that a structured settlement can work along with a special needs trust. Uh, so next, I think that uh, Jennifer is going to talk about the trustee options for uh, these different types of trusts we've been discussing. Right. So one thing you need to think about when you're setting up a trust is who is going to be the trustee. And there's two different options. You can either have a corporate trustee or an individual trustee. And it really will kind of depend on, on the amount of money and you know the specific situation but in general if you have a trust um you know that's going to hold a lot of money i'd, I'd say probably generally over a hundred thousand uh, dollars you may want to think about having a corporate trustee um the department of human services will require that if it's a special needs trust um if it's over a hundred thousand dollars they'll either require a corporate trustee or if it's an individual trustee, that the individual be bonded. Um, and with, with that amount of money, many times you just wanna have somebody who is very, um, they have a lot of experience in handling mm -hmm. trust, especially if it is a special needs trust due to all of the, you know, the rules and regulations. You want to have somebody who is really familiar with all of that. Um, so, if you're thinking, you know, if it's a lot of money that's going into the trust, you may want to do a corporate trustee. Uh, one thing to note about a corporate trustee is there will be fees that need to be paid to, to basically to have them administer the trust. Um, you know, typically it will vary depending on the trustee and usually based on the amount of money in the trust. Um, and another option would be to have the individual trustee. And many times, if you have a trust that's relatively small, um, under $100,000, it may be fine to have an individual be a trustee. Uh, typically, maybe a family member would be a good option. Um, you want to make sure, however, that the trustee um, has a good relationship with the beneficiary. Um, you know, you may not want to have somebody who doesn't get along well with the beneficiary because it could cause problems down the road. But if, if you have an individual trustee, you also may not have um, the fees that need to be paid for a trustee. Many times an individual, especially a family member, will serve without taking a fee. Um, so that, that can be a better choice with, again, a smaller trust if you, if you have somebody willing to do that. Um, you know, they, they need to be somebody who's responsible, who is able to keep good records, and again, be familiar with the rules and regulations regarding special needs trust to make sure that, you know, the person doesn't, the person with a disability doesn't lose their benefits because of, you know, something, uh, the trust pays for something that it should not have. So, um, you know, they're, they're generally, the, the things to think about when deciding what type of trustee to have, the amount of money in the trust, um, you know, who you have who might be able to serve uh, as an individual trustee. Um, and I think that that concludes our uh, little presentation to you on what to do if you're getting settlement money. Um, hopefully you found this helpful. And um, of course you can contact us if you have any questions. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.